Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. So Dean Webb has just come back from vacation, and he is overflowing with information. I mean, it's funny, Dean. You can't go anywhere or do anything without all these things happening to you. I mean, you're, you never know what it's like going in a little hole. You, you just you peek out there, and all these people come <laughs> looking for you. It's always a great day. Before we went on the air, I was telling you last night, uh, yes, late yesterday afternoon, 4 or 5 o'clock, we stopped on PGA Boulevard at the Waterway Cafe because we wanted to eat on the ocean. We'd been at the ocean for a week, so we wanted to keep our water thing going. And uh, we were sitting out under a gazebo, and we were just ordering from this lady, and this gentleman comes up to me and uh, says, Hey, Dean, you remember me? And there's a big six-foot-two guy, well, all buff and everything. And he, he looked so familiar, and he stuck his hand out and says, I'm Greg. And I says, Great, Greg. Where do I know you from? He said, I graduated from Faith Farm Okeechobee. And I go, That's where I recognize you from because you gave a graduation speech. So uh, I said, what are you doing? He said, I just want to tell you to know, look at me. I'm doing fine. I got a job as a waiter here at, at uh, here on the water, and I'm doing fine. I've got a condo about two miles from here, a place to live. And he says, uh, I'm going to Christ Fellowship Church. I'm in Celebrate Recovery, and I'm staying connected like you advise us to do with, with uh, other Christian people and stuff of like-minded. And he says, I'm doing fine. Oh, my gosh. So by the time that happened, you could hardly eat your uh, – was he oh. your waiter then? No, he wasn't oh. a waiter. He, <laughs> just, he'd seen me, I guess, come in the restaurant or something, and, and, and the waitress had already taken our order, and we were waiting for our food to come, and he came over and introduced himself. And, of course, we have – you know, not everybody graduates, so we have more people come in than people who, who graduate. So there's a you know five to 600 people a year. I can't – you know, I recognize a face, but I didn't know where when he says, do you remember me? I, I'm i going, people do that all the time, I and I don't remember. Yeah, they, and I apologize. Yeah. I said, you got to, you know, I, I just see so many people. And I sit through so many graduations that I, you know, I don't get down the weeds to get to know everybody. So um, I said, but I really appreciate you telling me you're doing well. You have no idea how that encourages me. Well, let know? me ask you then, based on what you just said. So people who have had addictions... Mm-hmm. they're not embarrassed to tell people that they've had addictions. I mean, talk about that. Would they not want to keep that private? Now, I know he knew you, but I think a lot of people will say that they've, uh, they're have recovered. Well, um, yeah, uh, it, it depends. Me, he knew because he was in our program at Faith Farm. He, uh, But uh, I, I don't know how he feels. Obviously, he's, he's told Christ Fellowship where he attends one of the chapel services on one of their campuses. So they, they must know about because they've been trying to help him get on his feet. And um, so so it's it's kind of new, you know, uh, to but him. I mean, okay, but that's in that little world. But would he go out and talk to people generally and tell people that, or he just keeps it to himself? Or how, what, um, what do people I don't know. Everybody do? he, he probably would because he was very open about it. But I don't know if he's totally open because it was just me. But but. He, I, I said, do people at Christ Fellowship know? He said, oh, yeah, they know I've been through recovery and I'm going to celebrate recovery on Friday nights and all this stuff. So uh, so he's been very open. It's very new to him. Um, again, that it just depends on the person. We've had people like from Washington, high up in the CIA, for example. They don't go back and tell people they came through the yeah. farm or multimillionaires that lost everything. They don't. They don't. They don't want to do that when they ask. Well, where have you been for two or three years? They they don't tell them they've been on a mass drunk and then gone to Faith Farm. They you know they usually say, well, I've been doing consulting or whatever, and they kind of cover it up. That's why it's difficult for us to know our recidivism rate, and 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 people that fall and people that stay. It's hard for us to know because of that percentage, which is up to half fifty percent, don't want people to know that they've been through the recovery process. They just don't and. Uh, uh, other people are so proud. I mean, they've, they've struggled so long. They're, they're so proud of what they've been through, and um, uh, it's just really neat. So, Dean, what's happened, the reason I even ask you is because I personally don't drink. Of course, Bill does. He has his wine. But we've been with people, and, uh, and they, they don't drink. And there are people I would think would have a glass of wine or something. Yeah. And I never ask why, <laughs> and they usually never. They'll say they'll just have water. And, uh, and I think... The reason I ask this is because one of the gentlemen we were with later told Bill that he had 
been drinking too much in his younger years, and now he doesn't drink anymore. But he didn't tell me that. That's interesting. You know, so That's interesting. so I guess they they they're proud of that. They don't. They know they can't drink, and they don't. But they don't often say this. So this is a man who's very distinguished. So it's just what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a weakness that they don't want to tell people about. I met a couple. I'm in a group of CEOs and uh, uh, 18 of us, and we meet monthly and uh, exchange ideas and problems and how to solve problems. And uh, we'll meet two, three at a time at a restaurant. Once a month, we were, three of us are required to meet, and they have a rotating schedule. Well, I met these two guys at the Okeechobee Steakhouse, and they're sitting in the booth across from me. And I, my book, You Turn to God, had just come out, so I signed and gave them each a copy, and they looked at it, and, and, then, and I told them it was on graduation speeches, and, and they kind of looked at each other, and then he looked at me, and he says, you know, both of us have come through drug recovery. And I was so shocked because these guys are big, own their own businesses. And, and, and they you never know, told you that before. Never, they've never said that in the group. Never, never told that. And they said, yeah, we got kind of went downhill. And he says, we, we actually knew each other from long ago and we kind of did it, did the drug thing together. And, uh, both of us came to the realization that we needed to help each other to get out of it. And we did. And, uh, and I said, you guys, I'm so shocked because you've never said anything. When we talk about our backgrounds and things that have influenced our life and these uh, CEO Vistage me, I said, You've never said that. And they said, well, it's not something that we're really proud of, you know, yeah. but, and, and we don't know if it would affect our clientele if they knew, he says, but we've been, he said, we've been clean for 20 something years, so it doesn't make any difference now, but it might make a difference to somebody else. So here's guys that I, we, we talk about really, I mean, these guys even talk about marital things that we try and talk about. I mean, just really detailed stuff. And, and, uh, and our motto is, uh, no one of us is as smart as all of us. So we bring our problems and, and try and solve problems. And uh, it's a great outlet. But the problem is, uh, in all this time, a couple of years I've been in the group, I, I, until, I, until they saw that I'd written this book on recovery, they never disclosed that they both. And, they, and I, I said, well, you know, until you want to tell the group, I said, it's going to be mum with me. I'm not going to say anything. I says, if you, that's up to you to disclose. I'm not, I said, if I said it, it'd be gossip. So I'm not going to do it. So uh, I said, but it's very heartwarming to me to know that you guys have reached the level you've reached in business expertise and owning these big companies and have, and have struggled with that and overcome the drug addiction. I said, that just, I can't tell you what that, how, how just encourages me so much. Yeah, and I'm sure that's true because you, generally speaking, the people who you help coming to Faith Farm uh, may not have attained that uh, high level in business, they not. They, there are some that have been. Um, I knew a guy who, uh, who was a multimillionaire, spoke seven languages fluently, and and uh, he got on drugs. He lost his business in Miami. He lost his wife. He lost his. He had a six million dollar home on Miami Beach. He lost that while he was in the farm. Got foreclosed on, and um, lost a home up in Princeton, New Jersey. That was his uh, summer or winter residence. I, I, when these people have all these multiple homes, I don't know. But anyway, um, there are people like that who who come down really, really hard from really high lofty positions. But it's the other ones that I was thinking about that they, some of them have grown up in homes that were very, you know, vindictive and very big problems. And for them to break out, yeah, to break out and to search for something that's going to give them a life for the first time, that's pretty brave of them. Yeah, it's huge. And those those people, for them, the recovery thing is is I I don't want to say it's more important, but it's they for them they've come farther. The others have been higher and crashed and come back, and are usually self disciplined. I've done it my way type thing. The other people have been trying to struggle. They crawl out. I mean, they they may not have had the full education. Uh, even high school, some of them, and uh, have never experienced a lot of financial uh, success. So for them to come from a low state and slowly crawl out of that out of that thing, it's just amazing for the, that they do that. I want everyone to know I'm Anita Finley. You're listening to the Boomer Time Show, and this is Dean Webb that we're having a great interview. He is the executive director of Faith Farm Ministries, and you can donate to faithfarm.org. We really hope you will. Uh, we're, you know, for people who just think that it's a thrift shop, it's so much more. Of course, you hear us talking about this 
every month, but uh, it is a very special. Actually, it's not just one special place. They have three, three places, three locations, and one is not uh, they're just all different from the other. But uh, if you want more information, go to faithfarm.org. If you want to call in Palm Beach County, you can call 561-737-2222. Um, and, and then you can always uh, tell them you want more information about it in Broward. I think the thing that's the most important is you always hear Dean with such enthusiasm. And they really do love all of you. If you're, if you're having an addiction, whether it's from drugs or it's from uh, alcohol, they really care about you. They don't embarrass you. So many of them who are now the, I guess they're the people who are in administration. Some of them have been uh, have, have been addicts, and and they have a new life. And this wonderful organization is rare. So we hope that you will go if you need to do. If you have some extra money, we certainly hope you'll donate it because, you know. And and Dean, maybe just to renew. Uh, we always talk about this, but. Just to think about every year you take 400 people, 400, whether it's women, men, and and you give them everything and they don't have to pay for it. I mean, that is so outrageous. I can hardly say that to people. I know. it. It's actually 445 beds, uh, 25 women, the rest are men at the three campuses. And uh, it really is amazing. Free is a very good price, you know, <laughs> uh, especially for a nine-month residential program. And the neat thing about being free is it doesn't create a burden. I mean, if let's say a guy is struggling and he's trying to provide for his wife and kids too. It doesn't put a burden on them to say, oh, you got a $1,000 a day recovery program like a lot of Palm Beach places are. Um, it's free. And so whatever arrangements they can get to get help, it helps their family. It, they don't need it from us. They're, it's free. And, and when you think of it, it's someone has a bed, uh, they have food, they have medical help if they need it, they learn trades. I mean, this isn't just a place you go and plop down. No, this is, matter of fact, the people that really change their life are the people that, that are highly motivated to change. Uh, there are a lot of people come in. One of our board members who wrote the Alpha Course, which we teed, it, it's a, it, it, he took the 12-step program and went back to the original Christian or, origin of it, where it was based upon Scripture. And, and we go back, and, and he recreated the 12-step program the way it was before they got politically correct and took God and everything out of it and talked about the higher power and all that stuff. Uh, he went back to the original, and this has the greatest impact on our people is the Alpha Course. Well, Di- uh, John Glenn uh, says this. He's on our board. He says this. Everybody at Faith Farm needs to be there. Unfortunately, not everybody wants to be there. So that, what you just said, is that's the key thing for our intake counselors to really try and determine is motivation because we provide the same thing to all of them, and not all of them stick it out or I mean it's a volunteer program they can walk out anytime they don't have to stay nine months now they do to get the total change because our program is very much designed both medically and psychologically to help the people but um, the problem is that if they walk off early a lot of them don't make it we've had calls where people have overdosed and stuff after they left early and that just grieves us breaks our heart and uh, because you know there's not many places where you can get a chance to totally turn your life around like you can at faith farm so um uh it just uh it's it's just you know we look for people that are motivated because those are ones that are going to change because they all go through the same course so i want to talk at this time uh, about a book that dean wrote called you turn to god wrong ways made right and it's a very special book. It's uh, every year, every, not every year. They have a lot of graduations all throughout the year. And, uh, and these are the speeches from some of those graduations. And this is the most psychological book. I mean, these people pour out their entire heart. They talk about what they did before, where they are now. I mean, mm-hmm. this is so beautiful. And so I can see where if someone would just read this book, if they're having problems and they read this book, they'll understand that they're just like so many others. Oh, yeah. A lot of, uh, matter of fact, we have an academic committee that's made up of our directors and our pastors and, and people from South Florida Bible College and all this stuff. And uh, the academic committee sets our our program. They, they make changes if necessary, tweak, whatever. 
Well, they have had such a pronounced influence that the women decided they were going to make, when they come into orientation, make them read U-turn. And so many people have, the women have gone, they'll read these stories uh, about the girl who screamed at God because he, her, she, over, her, her, the mate in the hospital, I mean, excuse me, in the motel, she went to the restroom, came back, and he was dead in the bed, and she, he'd overdosed and died, and she was screaming at God, you know, uh, why, why him and not me? I'm the one that got him addicted. Now he died. You know, well, she's spoken at one of our homecoming. She's now an addiction I was counselor. There. You were I was there? there, and and she's help counseling, helping people. She's, she's married. now married. Yeah, you know, and uh, I think she uh, got pregnant. Isn't yeah, she? yeah, I, I, have, I, coming, I remember that. Got a that. child coming, and um, and so they read these stories about people, and they'll say, "Go." Well, you know, I'm not that bad. Or they'll read the story of Troy Hardy, our director at Boynton, and, and see how he came in 11 years or 13 years ago uh, as, a, as an addict uh, when he spent all of his bonus money to, as a basketball player. He's a real tall, great athletic guy. Anyway, and he got really in trouble, and, he, and they see him walking around campus running a, you know, a $6 million revenue or campus. Uh, and and he came through just like they do. So what happens in the book? They now have made that mandatory because it's changed so many women. We had a woman come in, and I and uh, she came in to clean the office. She was brand new, and I didn't know her. And I was talking to her, and she says, uh, "I I said, tell me a little bit something about yourself." This happened last week. She said, uh, "You know, I came in and I was here one day," and she says, "And they made me start reading this book in orientation." So I was reading it, and she says. And I didn't want to be here. My parents pushed me to come in here and all this stuff. And she said, I was here one day. My dad showed up and says, guess what? We got a warrant for your arrest. And I asked the, the officer if I could come pick you up and bring you to court. And so she said, I didn't even know I had a warrant for my arrest for a DUI. So anyway, she says, my father came and picked me up and I took me to court. And she says, uh, uh, the officer was about to throw the book because that was not my first one. <laughs> and she said, uh, uh, he said, do you have anything to say for yourself? She said, yes, sir. She says, I've been at Faith Farm one day. And she said, uh, I didn't want to be there. But I read this book about other people that have changed their lives around. And she says, I was so encouraged that I really want to go there. Would you let me serve my time at Faith Farm? And the judge says, I know how they change lives. If you want to be there, I'm going to allow you to be there in lieu of incarceration. So she's back at the farm. So, oh, so anyway, I'm story. going, I'm going, you know, how, how a book can influence somebody in just one day to change their mind from not wanting to be there and gritting their teeth to all of a sudden realize they give hope, you know, well, I'm not as bad off as I just am there for a DUI. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't overdose anybody. I, you know, and so it, I, the 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 fallout byproduct of U-turn has been that it's been an encouraging thing to not only parents who have, might have a son or a doctor or a nephew or something addicted that they have ho- gives them hope, but if they can get the book to them and they read it, it gives them hope and they they might sign up and come in because you can you can apply online um, to any, any one of the three Faith Farms locations. So. Um, uh, it's the the fallout of that book, which I never anticipated. I'm just, just going to say that. Yeah. I, I just never anticipated that uh, about how it gave people hope because there are some pretty strong stories in there. And there are a lot of people, whether it's the same or, or maybe the story is worse off than they were, if so, that even gives them more hope. So, well, I'm, I haven't, I'm not as bad off as they were, and they changed their life. So the, the giving hope of change is the... I, it was the byproduct of that book I never anticipated. Well, I think what happened, and, and I know you and I have talked about this before, but it was the graduation stories were so <clears> impressive, <throat> and you got to thinking, and whomever even encouraged you, that why don't we write a book about it? And so that took a long time because you had to go to each one of those people. You had, Someone had to sit down, and they had to you know, take, I did this by tape recorder, then someone had to transcribe it. All right. And... It, the bottom line is, it is a unique uh, book. I mean, there I don't know if there's another book in the world that has anything like this. I mean, yeah. this is very, very powerful. And and it's true. And we talked about the next one. And, and the one thing that you mentioned to me, not only is it powerful for the people who've been turned around, but for their families. And yeah. that we talked about maybe that being 
some uh, sort of a little sequel, yeah. you know, PS at the end of the stories or something. But it's the people who love their kids so much and didn't know what to do to help them. Yeah, I was talking to a lady actually yesterday, uh, or a day before yesterday at the beach in New Smyrna Beach, just south of Daytona, and, and she was talking about um, a friend who had married, had just mar- married this lady, and she has a real codependent relationship with her son who's addicted, and she will not exercise t- tough love with him. Uh, you know, he'll get in trouble, need money, and she, she doesn't, she's afraid he'll do something crazy or, or, or kill himself, so she'll give him money and bail him out. And, and she said, we don't know what to do with her because this is a relatively new marriage, and this guy is just, is just destroying the relationship because he is, he is a byproduct of having to deal with this addicted son. And that that his wife, the son's mother, won't deal with. It is very common, isn't it? Oh, very common. And uh, and I I said, you know, I don't know how to. All I know is, people that have the ability to screw up the courage to exercise tough love, need to do that, because what's happening is this boy is killing himself slowly. And I guess the parents afraid that if they withhold money or exercise tough love or draw some line in the sand, so that's it, that he'll go out and do something that'll kill himself immediately. Either way, he's killing himself. The byproduct of tough love and lovingly setting boundaries and said, I love you and try and get them into a program or whatever. But at any event, if you, you know, I'm not going to keep giving you money because, you know, you're just going to buy drugs with it. The byproduct of doing that is it's a toss of the coin. Yeah, he could kill himself quicker instead of slowly. But the odds are he's got at least a 50-50 chance that if he goes into a program, he's going to turn himself around, and you're going to have a wonderful life with a son of yours. He's going to be wonderful. And that's what happens at Faith Farm. If, 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 they can, if somebody can exercise tough love, and we've had a lot of parents that have done that, and um, and uh, matter of fact, we just ha- we just had a girl graduate a couple months ago, um, and her father brought her down from Ohio. Well, she was in Orlando. She'd been an addict for twenty years, and um, and the father and mother just the the hell they went through up in Cincinnati, not never knowing if their daughter was in a ditch, whether she'd been killed or or what had happened, or or she they get a call late at night to send bailout money and stuff, and at some point. They just reached the point says, you know, you need to go into a program. You need to come to the end of yourself and admit you've got a problem and go into the program. So this woman's 40 years old now. She's been addicted 20 years. And she's got two kids, a, a teenager and a three and a half. Well, I'm telling you, she came in the program, and I was there on the golf cart when they drove up to the women's program when the father drove her up. She didn't look too good. <laughs> she looked pretty bad. <laughs> Uh, and she's a beautiful blonde lady. I mean, once she got cleaned up and stuff, she she, she has the most a vivacious personality. I think I met that one too. You might have met that was her, the Candy. woman, who, yeah, who couldn't couldn't stop talking about what, yeah, yeah, and she I did, yeah, and she. Um, what's happened is she finally came through Faith Farm. She got turned her life around. Uh, the father brought the three and a half year old son. They took care. They took care of the son while she was in the program. And that's and, and the father and mother knew understood totally that if a woman comes into our program, if she's not hundred percent safe with who's keeping her kid, she's not going to make it. Now that doesn't mean she was taking good care of the kid while she had him. Of course, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying they she got to feel comfortable, and she was comfortable with the father and mother doing it. So uh, they came down, made a big deal, brought their brought the son back, and what's so neat is there's a guy in the program who's a really sharp guy, and he. His, his name is Christopher, and it just so happens the three-and-a-half-year-old son's name is Christopher. Well, it, make a long story short, she got a job at a, at a, at a recovery center here because they, they like our Faith Farm graduates because they're so much more versatile. Now, they won't let them talk about God or any faith-based stuff uh, officially, but, of course, people, women come and ask questions, what, you know, for a reason for the hope in you. Why, why, you know, and she can tell them that she'd been through recovery. And, you know, she can slip in a little of her story. And uh, anyway, bottom line is she just married uh, Christopher. And uh, and and the the people that are, are, we have softball teams, the three faith farm play intramural sports in the, in the communities where they're at. And he will, and Chris, big Chris will have little Chris on his shoulders walking around. And they say, as a matter of fact, he loves that kid so much that now he's 
going to adopt them or something. Planning to adopt the sure. kid. And it's, isn't that coincidence that the both of them named Christian Prime? I, I like, mean, just, that's not even possible. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I know at Faith Farm we don't we don't turn a hundred percent around because we don't have control of what's in people's minds. Of they, and, and it's volunteer; they can walk off. But I'm telling you, Anita, people that will stick it out and stick out the nine months and do through our program. It's been we, we're in October. We've been doing this sixty five years. Oh, okay. I mean, we we've got we we've got it. We got it down. We know what will change lives. And people that will stick it out can re- revolutionize and turn their life around. And so we always beg you to uh, contribute money to Faith Farm, Farm because maybe you were an addict. And maybe in some way you got out of it, Who, however you did it. Wouldn't it be nice if you helped somebody? You know, you don't have to have been an <coughs> addict to send some money. But wouldn't it be nice to know that something uh, like that that uh, occurs here in South Florida, you, it's almost like le- leaving a legacy of your own. You're leaving a legacy of people. You may not know them, but they're another human being who just maybe wasn't as fortunate as you. So let me tell you again how to do this. You can go to their website. That's really important. And that's faithfarm.org, faithfarm.org. And when you do that, you'll see lots of stuff. You're going to just love it. And maybe if you are really special, you can attend one of the graduations, as I have, and you'll just walk away from there. In fact, when I get home, my husband will say, well, how was it? I'll say, I can't even explain it. (laughs) I said, I am just so, I feel so wonderful about what is happening here in society. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I know people that give uh, just, you know, tons of money to different organizations and uh, with varied results. And I just say this, it cost us about $3,000 a month per person. Uh, so nine months is going to cost $27,000. Uh, and, and and I just think, you know, if I had the money and I, I don't, but if I had the money, how gratifying would it be to take $27,000 and invest in a life to totally flip them around from prostituting and stealing to get drugs and robbing and everything and turn their life around, make them tax paying citizens who are start a family or, or go back to their family and put their life back on track. Well, I mean, with that, Dean, we're going to say, okay, everybody, you know what to do. And I thank you very much for being here with us as usual. Great stories. Thank you for having me on. I love to talk about Faith Farm. <laughs>